Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of Ryan Zimmerman. We're going to the US of A, baby. Woo woo! Let's go. Sin and Tonic! Hello, my glorious sinners. How are we all doing this fine day? Hope you're doing well. Hope you're having a beautiful week. Let's dive into today's case. Coldwater Creek, Warren County, Ohio. Boom. That's where we are. On the 5th of January in 2016 at Coldwater Creek, a dog walker, always a poor dog walker, I'm so sorry for them, found what they thought was human remains. But they were a little dubious about it, weren't quite sure, so they took a picture of the bones and they called the police department, who then came out quite quickly because from the pictures that they were sent, they did believe that this was indeed human remains. The bones that they found were not the entire body, if you like, it was just the torso. So from the elbows down was missing and from the knees down was also missing and also the head. There were saw marks on the bones to prove that the body had been dismembered. How much proof do you need? And the DNA from the body was put into the database but there was no match. Now this would become a cold case for four years, they couldn't identify who this body was. And then, in August of 2021, a woman named Sarah Buzzard was arrested in relation to this case. Who is Sarah Buzzard, you ask? Sarah Buzzard was born on the 22nd of August in 1991, making her 30 at the time of her arrest in 2021. She was born in Indiana, Sarah married her high school sweetheart when they were very young, but just before they went to college. Once they were married, they moved to Columbus, Ohio, where Sarah would go to art college. So she was an arty person. Corey and Sarah went on to have an open relationship. I believe that's what you would call it. So you both can date whoever else you want to date. And so, uh, I guess in each different personal situation people decide on the rules for themselves so if you're going to have an open relationship well you can do this but you can't do that. Corey and Sarah would actually seek out other partners so they would look for other people online people to date and you know whatnot. I'm not sure what the rules were between Sarah and Corey and maybe I think it sounds like the rules changed and it also sounds, from what Sarah has told us, like Corey was really in control of their relationship and the rules and, you know, the, the openness of the relationship. And he had a very specific idea of what the perfect relationship looked like. This perfect relationship involved three people, a man, a woman and a trans person. So that is quite specific, isn't it? That's what his perfect relationship looked like. Enter Naira Whitaker. Now, effectively, Naira was the perfect candidate to complete this perfect relationship, in Corey's opinion, because she was a transgender woman. However, Naira was only in a relationship with Sarah. Sarah had met Naira online and they had formed a relationship just the two of them. So I think that's, yeah, that's right, isn't it? So even though Corey had his perfect, his ideal relationship vision, they were an op in an open relationship, which meant that Corey could date and do whatever he wanted to do with other people, and Sarah could do the same. So Sarah took it upon herself. Maybe she felt like she wanted to, I'm putting words into her mouth, but control who this third party was going to be in this perfect relationship. It was only when Corey discovered that Naira was a transgender woman that he then wanted to be included in the relationship. And I think that kind of, I, th I don't think that went down well. I think Naira had met Sarah and they were in a relationship. And Naira, I, I, I couldn't find much information on that, but I don't think it, that was Naira's bag. I think she was, she wanted to be with Sarah. And then Naira ended up going back to her hometown. So the relationship with Sarah ended at this time. Corey met somebody called Ryan Zimmerman. They met online and while Ryan wasn't yet transitioning to be a woman, that was his aim. That's what he wanted to do. 
Brian was 21 at the time of our story. He had a much younger brother who he really enjoyed spending time with. He loved computer games and cartoons. He seemed really sweet in, in his pictures. He's got a very, very sweet face. I know you should never judge a book by its cover, but he, he does look really sweet. But there was another side of his personality that he kept hidden away from his family. He had actually made a post on Craigslist saying that he was looking to be in a relationship as a subservient woman. And that is how he met Corey. I imagine that Corey felt like Ryan was going to be the third part in his perfect relationship. But there was a problem and that problem's name was Sarah because Sarah did not like Ryan. She didn't like him one bit. She found him to be meek, weak. She was not keen at all. They'd had a conversation over the internet and she already knew, like, he wasn't flo floating her boat. In Sarah's version of events, she agreed to Ryan moving in with the couple as long as he paid rent and bought his own food and it was on a short-term basis while he found somewhere else to live and got himself a job. I don't think that was truly the case. I feel like Corey had the upper hand in their relationship, in their marriage, and what he said goes, I feel like he was trialling Ryan. He wanted Ryan to be part of his perfect relationship and that Sarah didn't really have a choice, but that's just my opinion. And then the apartment became quite busy because Naira returned. The return of Naira. Ryan was now living in the spare bedroom. So when Naira came back, she put some sheets across the living room and made herself like a makeshift bedroom. So at this point, it would seem like Corey has chosen his partner for his vision in this three-way relationship. But Sarah's not really feeling that, and she's chosen her own partner, who I don't think was really into the whole three-way thing anyway, and she just wanted to be with Sarah. Not so much a menage a trois as a four-way. Or is it a four-way? Not really. Naira and Ryan, they're not in any sort of relationship together. So it's like a two-way, two-way tied together. You know, I'm not sure. I don't make up the rules. But all was not well in their abode. This was not actually a very, you know, cool situation. Naira really, really did not like Ryan. Sarah did not like Ryan. And I'm not really sure why they disliked him so much. Was he a threat? Perhaps Corey really did have a lot of control in the relationship and therefore Naira and Sarah were very worried that he was going to ask Naira to leave and that, you know, this sort of perfect relationship with the three, Ryan, Sarah, Corey, was, you know, his ultimate goal. So therefore, Ryan was quite a threat. But he seemed like he really was subservient and submissive. Is that the right words? I think their problem with him is that he was, it almost sounds cruel. Like he was just quiet and a bit meek and they were they found it really pathetic but there was a lot of anger and a lot of hatred in the end towards Ryan and those qualities of being sort of meek and quiet and you know not a go-getter or whatever like does that really warrant that much hate I feel like there must have been more underlying their hatred than just the fact that he was a bit of a wet blanket like how can that anger you so much you know someone of just an unassuming nature that's the whole point, they're unassuming, they're just, if anything, it's easier to sort of pretend that person doesn't exist, in, I'm, I'm guessing. But they really did grow to hate Ryan. Sarah would say that Naira actually went on, and we have to take all of this with a pinch of salt because this is Sarah's, purely Sarah's word. She said that Naira went on to talk about killing Ryan. That was something that came up in their conversations. But she didn't really take it seriously because Naira spoke about killing people all of the time. Massive red flag, perhaps. Almost like, oh, that's just what she's like. That's just what she's like. Oh, good old Naira, that's just what she's like. You know what she's like? Really? Oh. Sarah would say that Naira would fantasise about killing people quite often running people over in her car, 
oh, what would happen if I just got up and just shot that person in the head? Like, things like that. So, troubling. After Ryan had been living at the property for a few weeks, Corey, he too got tired of Ryan. And he asked Ryan to leave. Fair dues, if this isn't working out, great. So on one Friday in September, he asks Ryan to leave, this isn't working out, and Corey has actually got a date lined up with somebody else and he's gonna be away for the whole weekend. So he's like, can you just pack up your stuff and go? I don't want you here when I get back from my weekend of fun. Corey would tell Sarah that that's what he had told Ryan and that he expected him to be gone at the end of the weekend. Ryan was upset and he asked Sarah to, you know, is there anything you can do? Can you talk to Corey? I want to stay. But Sarah probably took great pleasure in saying, well, you know, this is what he wants and you've got to go because she didn't like him anyway. However, how freaking ever, despite the fact that Ryan most likely was packing himself up and he was going to go in a, a matter of days that weekend, Naira had it in her mind, again, take it with a pinch of salt because this is all coming from Sarah, that she wanted to kill Ryan. If we believe what Sarah has said, that Naira often fantasises about killing somebody, it might be that she had just decided that this was her, mo her moment, this was her time. She had researched online methods of killing another person, one of which was mixing bleach and vinegar to make almost like a toxic gas. Sarah said that Naira only gave her a very small role to play. Sarah doesn't seem to be in much control of her own life in any of this, does she? Corey tells her what to do. Corey's got the perfect relationship. Naira's going to kill someone. Naira's going to give her a small role in this. It's not a rendition of freaking Shakespeare, love. Sarah said that she did not stop Naira. She didn't stop her planning. She didn't stop her talking about it. She didn't stop anything from happening because she loved her. What? I love Paul, but I certainly would stop him if I felt like he was going to do something that would end him up in prison. End him up? You know what I mean? Or, you know, I, like, I love you, mate, but I don't want to go to prison, thank you very much. Like, uh, stop talking. Stop telling me things. No. If that's what you want to do, go ahead, Sunny Jim. But actually, no, I wouldn't, you know, if you love someone, you would stop them from doing something freaking ridiculous. Would you not? According to Sarah, this is how it went down. Sarah and Naira waited outside of the office. Ryan was in the office at the apartment. They waited outside for him to come out. When he did, Sarah sort of grabbed him from behind and pulled him down onto the floor. Naira then placed a cloth with bleach and vinegar over his mouth and his nose until he died. Sarah said that she was so traumatised by the whole thing that she just went into the office and she hid and cried because it was just too much. She went on to say that Naira then put tape around Ryan's mouth and nose just in case he wasn't dead to make sure that he was. And then on her own, Naira moved his body to the bathroom and into the bath where she proceeded to decapitate the body so that Sarah would be able to come into the bathroom to help with dismemberment because Sarah had an issue with looking him in the eye or seeing his face. I I can't even. Ryan's hands and feet and head were placed in the freezer. They then tried to dismember more parts of the body but weren't very successful so they ended up putting everything into a big bag and putting that bag into Ryan's own car, in the, in the trunk of his car. Along with tools and rags and everything that they'd used to dismember his body. The plan was to drive to Illinois, dispose of his body parts there, and then get a bus back. However, they stopped for gas. Stopped for gas. And when they then got back in the car, it wouldn't start. It wouldn't start, it broke down. Broke down. <sighs> Can you believe it? 
body, dismembered body in the in the trunk, we call it a boot, in the boot of the car, and it's broken down. What the deuce? I, if you were them, wouldn't you be having sweaty palms? <laughs> so they had to be towed. They had to actually, so with a dismembered body in the boot, they were towed back to their road, where they then just started all over again. And they moved everything, I believe, into Sarah's car. Sarah or Naira's, one of their cars, and they just started the process again. But this time, they'd been up for 36 hours at this point. It's a long, old time. 36 hours. I mean, how do you it even actually? I, I'm i made differently. Can't do that. So they've been awake a long time. So they are driving along. And what they decided to do is they decided to just put parts and tools and rags and separate everything in dumpsters along the way. So all different dumpsters that were going to be picked up. They were so tired that they had to keep stopping for breaks and to nap and stuff like that because they were just knackered and they were going to crash the car and you, you can't be crashing a car when you've got a body in it. Eventually they ended up dumping the torso in a wooded area and then they went home. They got back at about one or two in the morning after having been awake for nearly 40 hours. Corey had come back from his trip. He was like pissed off, like, where have you been? What's going on? Where's Ryan? They said, oh, he left, you know, he packed his stuff and he went. The next day, Naira placed Ryan's head into a large soup pan, along with his hands and his feet, and made a concoction to, you know, sort of dissolving situation. Corey ended up moving out he moved out, he left Sarah, and he went on to be in a relationship with another woman. Sarah and Naira moved in together and they continued their relationship. Everywhere they moved, the head, hands and feet of Ryan went with them. On the 14th of January in 2016, Sarah and Corey got divorced. And on the 26th of January, didn't wait very long, Naira and Sarah would marry, and at around this time, Ryan's remains were discovered. Sarah and Naira saw this on the news, but then it just completely died down. And like I say, the case went cold for four years. So they just got on with their life, with their marriage, as if it had never happened. In the January of 2020, police found that there was a, an open missing persons case where DNA had not been collected yet from the from the missing person and the description of the person fit with the remains that they they had so they asked the family of this missing person to give them the dna this missing person was ryan zimmerman and this then identified his body when they knew who he was they looked into his background they looked at what was going on for him and stuff like that and it was a long time it took a while but they followed like his cyber trail to work out what had gone on. His family had reported him missing in 2015 in the November and that all they knew is that he had moved in with people he'd met online. So that was what the investigation looked at was all of his online staff who he'd spoken to. When he had created his Craigslist post, the person that replied, which really was Corey, Corey Buzzard, He's used a false name and stuff like that. So they had to search, find him, and then they did. And that is how they then found Sarah Buzzard. I imagine Corey said, well, I went out for the weekend. When I came back, he wasn't there. So she was arrested August 2021. When she confessed to being a part of Ryan's murder, she massively implicated Naira, threw her right under the bus. She was like, it wasn't me, it was her all of it, her idea, her plan, I just got given a small roll. The police then went to go and arrest Naira, as you would. And when they went to do so, Naira took a gun out of a bag and shot herself in, in the head. Apparently this had been agreed upon. If they were to be found out at any point or anything like that, then that was the plan to do that. I watched the interviews with Sarah and she doesn't show any sadness or emotion when she talks about what happened to Ryan. Even though she said she was disturbed and she went and hid in the office and cried, 
when she's recounting the story, there's no emotion there at all whatsoever. The only time she showed any emotion or anything like that in any of the interview is just when she realises that her wife is gone. Sarah was charged with all counts. There was 18 counts of stuff like kidnap. I can't think of the word, you know, when they do bad things to the body, things like that. She was charged with everything because she was the only surviving suspect. However, she took a plea deal so that she could avoid the death penalty. So with that in mind, she then changed her story. So it's difficult to really, no one will ever know other than Sarah and Naira and Ryan and they're no longer here. But no one will really know what happened other than her because what's true? What's true? She changed her story to say that she jumped him when he came out of the office and that she put him into a headlock and that she just held him there until he died. She said that she, she strangled him to death. She said it was her that did it. And she did show remorse and she has shown remorse since. However, in my opinion, you can go and check out, there's some footage and things, but in my opinion, that's only to reduce her sentence. That's what it feels like to me. She's admitted it, she's taken a plea bargain, she's she's doing all the right things so that she might at some point get out of prison. She's listened to her lawyers. So I feel like there's quite a lot to unpick there because what was the motive behind killing Ryan? And we only have Sarah's word for this. Naira is no longer there. Is Sarah the mastermind behind all of this? Did she feel so out of control and like she didn't have any control in her relationship with Corey and Corey was trying to force his narrative on her of this perfect relationship and she didn't really want to she just wanted to be with Naira so was it all Sarah's idea was she like do you know what this Ryan has just caused so many problems mm -mm. but he was gonna leave he was gonna go like her problem was about to be over so I'm I'm not sure about that not sure or we weren't there we don't know did he say i'm not going you said i could be here for three months i think they had an agreement where ryan was allowed to live there for three months while he found a job and another place to live perhaps he said i'm not going and i'm going to be here for three months like i agreed and she just saw red and she wanted him gone and also corey had said can you make sure he does go you know, maybe she was like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble here if I don't. I mean, people kill for really stupid reasons, don't they? It could be that. Again, we don't know. But I just, my brain tries to think of like, oh, what? I wonder why. But then equally, if what Sarah says is true about Naira, then Naira really did have a fantasy about killing somebody. And maybe she just thought Ryan was the perfect soft target which sounds awful doesn't it but maybe that's what she thought and maybe she thought look his family don't know where he is it's the perfect opportunity he's not going to fight back he's meek he's weak they thought him to be that maybe Naira did just think yeah I'm gonna do it I'm gonna see what it's like who knows or maybe they had a massive row maybe they did have a huge falling out and she just saw red and yeah like I say people kill for like a lot less don't they Anyhow, it is just incredibly tragic and very sad for Ryan and his family. I always find it tricky when there's no definitive this happened. Oh, and they did find blood in the car. They found his car. There was blood in the bathroom at the apartment and stuff like that. So there was physical evidence as well. But just, yeah, like the actual mm -mm -mm ins and outs of what really happened, we will never know. I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Centronic. I hope you join me next week for another true crime story with a glass or a jug or a jug or another hug of gin. Any case suggestions, drop them in the comments. I love it, I love it, I love it. And I will see you all next week. Bye loves. Bye.